So today's lecture is uh, DCS part A, I guess, hey? So let's see if we got that here, share. Let me know when it pops up for you guys. Yep. All right, so this uh, first of, mute your mic if you're not talking. Uh, first of three ILMs on distributive control systems here. Uh, the first ILM is, uh, is a basic uh, general outline of the of kind of the whole the whole DCS idea. So we'll take you through the, the different uh, functional levels of uh, distributive networks. Then we'll talk about the software a little bit and some ways that they're configured and physically set up. But it's all pretty uh, surface level, DCS kind of 101 is kind of what this lecture is like. So it's not, uh, not particularly heavy, which I guess is uh, nice for you guys. So let's get at her and see what we got. About 40 slides here. Starting out, first objective says that we want to describe the hardware components and the buses of a DCS. So we talked a little bit about buses uh, earlier. We talked about field buses uh, and things like that. And we're going to develop that a little bit by talking about different kinds of buses that exist in a distributive control network. So we expand on uh, the field bus that, we, that we're all fairly aware of. And then we kind of build on uh, some of the stuff we touched on when we were talking about Foundation Field Bus, when it had two, uh, two different kind of buses. You know, they had the, the field bus level that was a lower speed, and then they had that high-speed Ethernet bus, which was a second portion of, of their network system that Foundation had developed. Uh, and we'll see that if we look at DCSs, uh, it, it kind of builds off of of that structure. So we'll look at the different buses or levels, they like to call them, um, <coughs> of a distributive control system. So we start with the system layout. <coughs> Excuse me. So by definition, a distributed control system is functionally integrated, meaning that the data is exchanged throughout the, pro the different process areas. Uh, it also consists of sub subsystems that can be physically separate and remotely located from one another. So that's a long way of saying that it's a distributed control system. I have a controller over here running this portion of the plant. I have another controller over here running this portion of the plant, another controller over here running this portion of the plant. So instead of having one huge rack of controllers here in the operator's control room, we've distributed that control to each and each individual process uh, module. So if we lost any individual one of these, it doesn't bring down the, the whole kind of system. And it's it's a way for the uh, facility to kind of share the work that's that's going on in terms of processing. So we'll we'll expand on this a little bit. Uh, how do we get these controllers out there? What's the connection with the, the control room? Uh, We'll introduce some of the hardware we talked about yesterday in communications with a, with a gateway that will convert what's going on on this side into something that we can use on this side that the engineering guys can use. And we'll go even farther from there up to the point where the bean counters are and the accounting guys are who want to keep track of performance values and things like that. So it's the whole, whole system. So we talk about the system architecture when we're talking about what the whole system looks like is the system architecture. And DCSs are organized into a hierarchical architecture that consists of functional levels, uh, which enables the separation, uh, improved reliability, and improved scalability for a control system. And scalability you see there in yellow as a self-test question. And scalability means that you can, you can make it bigger or smaller uh, in terms of I.O., um, depending on, on your needs. So that's what scalable means. You can start out with 100 tags, and if you need another 100 tags, you can add to it, and so on and so forth. If it needs to be smaller, you can make it smaller. So we talk about the architecture. We talk about these different levels. So basically, we're going to be talking about four different levels. Uh, we'll have to understand what functions are occurring 
in each level and some of the hardware that's contained in each level. And for the most part, this is fairly intuitive for us, um, but we'll spend some time talking about each of these. So the four levels, field bus level or process level, this is where our end devices are, our valves and our transmitters and things like that. And this is where we, we do our measurement and, and we open and close valves and all that stuff. This is all the stuff, like the name implies, that's out in the field. That data gets sent from our field devices up to a controller somewhere, so that introduces us to number two, which is the controller. Pardon me? Not for me? Okay, moves us up to the controller level here, and as that name would imply, that's where the, the controllers are, so the process logic functions are in there, uh, sequential control uh functions are in there all our programs and, and uh, things like that emergency shutdown controller in there and you'll find hardware controllers your io your logics your rtus motor control centers sis centers those are the types of hardware you're going to find at the controller level then we kind of have a major separation between the controller level and the operations uh, engineering level typically uh, we kind of consider the lower two levels the field sort of side and then the, the, these upper two levels are kind of the uh, operations or enterprise level side so they're all connected but a little bit more unique so the operations or engineering level you're going to find your operator stations uh, engineering stations uh, hardware and uh, things that store the data it's called a data historian so all the uh, values that you have for the day are always updating and getting written to a database to be stored for later dates if someone if some other unit needs data this is where you're going to find that data uh, every 24 hours you're going to back up the data for the day and all that kind of stuff uh, alarming also takes place at the operations engineering level there and usually the hardware up at these levels here are basically uh, the servers where all the data comes to and goes away from that it gets shared out of and then the workstations that allow you to access that data and make changes so the operator workstations where they you know open and close things and change set points and whatnot data from that level there will move up to the top level which is called the enterprise level or the business level if you want to look at it that way uh, the functions there include looking at all the data that's related to production, inventory, management, accounting, uh, and reports and things like that. So this is the uh, this is in the office typically. This is where the you know the managers are looking to see what our performance is for the week and how much we produced and all that kind of stuff done at the enterprise level. And again, the enterprise level uh, has the has servers there where the data. Uh, is stored and then the workstations or the computers where the uh, people can access the, the data that's collected from the field bus all the way up. So that's it. It's a structured architecture like this. It's hierarchical, meaning that there's levels uh, of improved, or not improved, but uh, levels of increasing uh, right on responsibility or however you want to categorize that, but they're, uh, they're different. Oh, easy now. Oh, easy now. Okay, so here's kind of a big graphical representation of what that previous table kind of looked like, showing you the hardware at the different levels and kind of where you see uh, where you see the breaks between them. So field bus process level here, all our all our end device here. Um, controller level all makes sense here. The controllers in there. Uh, our network adapter cards are in here. Uh, foundation field bus linking devices or linking devices like foundation field buses linking devices uh, would be in here as well allowing us to connect to our uh, our main bus from there that data can be taken out of the controller or sent to the controller to make set point changes and whatnot here uh, through the workstations that are contained at the operation engineering level here and this is the first place where you'll you'll see uh, the computer or the server that's behind everything where the, the data comes in, you know, it scans all the I.O., picks up that data, writes that data to the server, it resides in the server, uh, it sends it out to the workstation so you can see what valve is open, what percent, and so on and so forth, and if you want to change things, then it'll send data to that server and then back out the server to the controller, out of the controller, back to the field devices. And, and so on. So all these things are connected. At the very top level, the enter, enterprise level here, we'll see we have a new 
uh, a new network up here called the plant network and this is more than likely going to be a, a fiber or at the least an ethernet network that basically connects all your offices together uh, with workstations and allows access to the collection of data, the same collection of data that everything else is using here uh, in order to access it for the, the purposes uh, that we described in the previous, previous slide there, the accounting and that kind of thing. Okay, so we'll look at uh, starting at the field bus process level here, some of the uh, details and variations in the, in the field bus process level here where the control system connects to the processes. And we break it out into three different, three different methods that we kind of connect our field devices into the, into the I.O. So they're electronic marshalling uh, through a network linking device and through I.O. chassis marshalling. So, uh, I.O. chassis marshalling will be kind of the exact same thing that we looked at when we were playing with the control logics. Uh, we have modules in here and each module will take, you know, a, a bunch of transmitters or whatever. Then we have electronic marshalling, uh, which is kind of like the, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Delta V system or not, like their charm system where you have basically one field device coming into one little I.O. card. And I'll, and I'll show you what that looks like uh, in the next couple of slides here. Um, but we're going to try to differentiate here the difference between electronic marshalling, I.O., or typical, what you normally con, uh, conceive as, as uh, your I.O., this I.O. chassis marshalling, and then the, the third type here uh, done through network linking devices. So foundation is a prime example for this one. Okay, so here's what they kind of look like uh, in in real life here, and these are all snapshots uh, snapshots out of our lab here. So I/O chassis marshalling. This is what we're we typically see in terms of I/O in more, most facilities. Here you have a number of devices coming into a an I/O card, an input card, or a, a output card, whether it's discrete or analog or whatever it might be, but a number of channels uh, that accept a a number of devices, so 8, 16, whatever it happens to be, those are the common sizes. Electronic marshalling, uh, in our lab we have uh, what's called uh, charms. Uh, this is a Delta V uh, kind of special thing. I would imagine that there's other manufacturers that kind of have the same, the same thing here and the way that these electronic marshalling things work here is you have one field device comes and connects to one of these little what they call charm modules. So this would be an analog input module, an output module, a discrete in, a discrete out, whatever it is. But one device hooks up to one of these things here. And the cool thing about this electronic marshalling here is that you can pull out these little uh, modules while you're hot, while you're running, and change them out if they fail. So that's pretty cool. And worst case scenario, even you're, you're affecting one I.O. point, whereas if we had a failure in one of these uh, marshaled I.O. modules here, you'd have to dis disconnect everything and then change out the module. Um, I believe with the Delta V you can also do that hot, but that's not a recommended practice usually. Uh, the third type here is through network linking devices here, and again the network linking device, uh, this is what we have downstairs in the 960B lab and we can have a look at this uh, when we get down there if we get well we will get down there somehow one way or another uh, whether it's uh, over the next six weeks or whether it's going to be for three days but basically here you'll be able to see how that linking device works where we bring uh, power in and we connect up our trunk to to one of these units here and then from the linking device we have individual wire runs going out to uh, out to the I.O. Okay, moving up from the field uh, bus level up to the controller level here. Controller level of the DCS performs basic process control function uh, using PLCs, DCS controllers, safety controllers, I.O. modules, and network hardware. So this is all the, uh, the bigger hardware. Three common methods that controllers are connected and used to communicate with the field devices are these three ones that we that we've already talked about here. So modular, I.O. chassis marshalling, which is standard, uh, electronic marshalling, which is the little charms, and then the linking device, which is the uh, field bus kind of trunk spur uh, method. Okay, uh, looking at these again a little bit 
more detail here, modular I.O. marshalling here, it connects the field instruments to the modules. Each module connects field devices of the same type. So we have an analog input module, analog output module, discrete in, discrete out, uh, RTD, temperature module, heart modules, foundation modules, device net modules, and Ethernet modules. So we've seen all of these uh, modules when we were in a lab doing uh, Logix 5000 labs. And that is uh, that is modular I/O chassis mod, uh, marshalling. So that's exactly what this uh, uh, this represents. Electronic marshalling uses individual I/O point modules that only connect one process data point to the DCS. So just like the uh, I/O marshalling uh, here, the modular style, same idea. Uh, individual functions for each module but it's only one device per module versus uh, you know eight or sixteen channels so same basic collection of uh, functional abilities in terms of these modules okay so here's kind of a bigger picture of what that module looks like uh, and you'll see AI AO DI DO all in the same kind of rack but with individual uh, individual modules for individual uh, field devices. These are connected just like the backplane on a on a PLC. They're connected communication wise to these network cards. Usually, you'll have two of them for redundancy, and we haven't done a bunch of talk about redundancy yet. But uh, two of them in there, and then the connection ports that will connect one of these to another one of these to another one of these to another one of these, and we build our network that way. Any questions yet? No. So far, so good. All right. Thank you. All right. Linking device. The last uh, method here, field I.O. connects to a DCS with a specialized linking device. And we're just going to leave it at, for example, foundation field bus linking device. And just know that that foundation field bus linking device is the link between the field devices and the controller network, so the field network and the controller network. Moving up a level from the controller level to the operation engineering level, this is where the plant uh, personnel, not personnel, personnel uh, will configure, operate, and maintain the control system. That's it. Don't need to talk much more about that. I think you guys get it, right? Enterprise level, top level where the business management and process control information merge. So I always, uh, when I'm lecturing, I say this is where the bean counters uh, can access the data to see who's doing what, why, what are the results, what are the production numbers, how much product did they bring in, how much product did they put out, what capacity are we running at, all these things that uh, trickle down through your uh, your foreman and uh, the manager to tell us how the, how the plant is working all together. So that takes us to different types of uh, system buses and networks. And we've touched on this kind of before, but you'll see we got our field network, which we've, we've touched, talked about before, whether it's coming into a uh, modular I.O. like we normally see, or whether it's a field network here that's connected via a linking device, but we have the field network down below. We have a controller network above which connects all the controllers together. So here all the field devices get connected to a controller somewhere. Here all the controllers get connected together. Here on the operations or engineering level here, we have all the workstations and servers that are connected into the bus. And then finally we have yet another network, uh, the enterprise level, which has its own version of the bus. And the thing to remember as we talk about these different buses here is that there's gonna be different uh, security, I guess, security and permissions that are that are allowed for different levels of this. Uh, you're not going to have somebody wearing a suit in the office being able to change the configuration values of a transmitter or to change ladder diagrams or anything like that. So there'll be permission and security things that we'll talk about a little bit later that are kind of tied to each of these different uh, networks, and that's kind of why they're unique. And just like we saw in some of the um, protocols, you know, we might have uh, 
a 31.25 megabyte network here in the on the field side, but we might have a uh, we might have a gigabyte network up here on the enterprise level. So there's unique properties that are kind of associated with each of these buses that we have in a distributed network. Okay, field level networks reside below the PLC, DCS, or other host controllers. Uh, they replace analog wiring, they com communicate the diagnostics and the secondary variables, all these things that we get by going to digital devices. Uh, they'll increase map measurement accuracy and they allow us to do the configuration over the DCS. So we're right in there, full digital now, and we're utilizing all the different bonuses that we get from these digital field bus type networks. Okay, so a review, uh, nothing super important uh, here, but just to differentiate that there are different types of field bus networks. So we have the heart at 1200 baud or 1.2 kilobytes with shielded twisted pair. Then we got our device net, which we knew has the coax and is 500 kilobytes. Uh, and then we got the foundation field bus, which has 31.25 kilobytes, but then they also have that HSE network, which I'm sure we'll touch on uh, later. So here's four different kinds of, of different field bus networks. Field level, I guess I'd better say instead of field bus, but there are buses. Okay, controller level networks provide communication between controllers and the I, excuse me, I.O. of the DCS. Communication is often done with a local bus chassis uh, or electronic marshalling or some type of a proprietary controller to controller network here. So you're seeing the bus in this case here is a backplane, this case here also as a backplane, right? So we're talking between our I.O. modules and our, and our controllers via this backplane. So not a great big spread out system like we have here. It's, it's uh, part, of the, part of the chassis. Same idea with our, uh, with our charms or electronic partialing versions here. Operations network provide communication between controllers, controllers, the data servers, the operator workstations, and the engineering workstations. So kind of the first place where all of that information uh, comes together and, and kind of goes in and out, I guess, uh, with people uh, involved in it. So the operator workstations will receive the data over the network and then display that data for the operators using an HMI or the computer screen. Uh, engineering workstations, uh, same exact hardware, uh, allow us to run the programs that allow us to maintain and configure the DCS, do our programming, that kind of thing. And the other piece of hardware there, the server, the biggest piece of the hardware there, uh, run the database software that gathers, organizes, and stores all that data. So when it comes in, it gets stored in there. When someone needs it, someone takes it out. And that's kind of the, uh, the warehouse, I guess, to to put the data for people who, who want it and need it. Okay, so operation engineering network here again, uh, just a bus like everything else here, um, all connected in parallel, servers in parallel, engineering stations, workstations, data can go in, data can come out of all of these things. So that's the network. Enterprise level, again, up here, connects to the other side of the server. So here we have our operations uh, engineering level, sending data to and receiving data from our server. And we have a firewall now here inside this server, as you'll see on the left-hand side. And this is basically that, uh, that mechanism that keeps people up here from messing with things down here and, and vice versa. So connecting the control network to provide access to operational DCS information uh, and to support business planning and also for remote access. And that's something that's uh, new uh, since I've been in the field, lots of these little sites now, you can actually access them uh, you know, via your phone. So that mechanism uh, has to be in place here and you would see a, a, a wireless gateway or something like that in there that allow us to take our wireless signal from outer space on our phone and get tied into this enterprise network and finally down into here where we can make some changes. So enterprise level, again, connected through a firewall and the purpose again is to limit access and protect our data. Objective two, getting out of the hardware and the 
uh, physical layout of everything here and into the software of a DCS. And the software programs of a DCS are no different than the software programs really of uh, what we would say is a PLC. Basically a PLC is kind of a standalone control system whereas a DCS is a bunch of PLCs that are all connected together. So we'll look at the software. It's all very similar. It's all, you know, based on Explorer and, and Windows because we're all familiar with that. And, and we've had the same experience um, using Logix 5000 than we would, for example, when we get into Delta V, which is what we use for the DCS portion of the course here. Okay, so software programs. Common tasks performed by the DCS are configured with the software programs or software suites. So we use Studio 5000 when we were playing with the, the Logix uh, hardware, but we're going to use uh, Delta V has their own suite. Um, and within Delta V's suite, they have something called Delta V Operate, which is the operating system software. They have Delta V Control Studio, which is the control strategy software where we do all our, our programming and stuff like that. And then they have the Delta V Operate Configure, which is like the operator screen. So you can uh, you can make your graphics up there and show your tanks and your levels and your temperatures and your on-off switches and your handoff autos and your set points and all that kind of good that kind of good stuff. So most manufacturers and most systems uh, have their own unique suite, but they're all relatively simple and uh, comparable in terms of what's contained within those suites. So something that makes it all work, something that allows us to program it and configure it, and then another one that allows us to access the, access the data in there and make changes uh, and, and actually run the facility. Okay, uh, the operating system software, again, uh, loaded onto the hard drive of the engineering operator workstations, and it contains all kinds of functional uh, features. Uh, the user manager, for example, is used to set up username, passwords, and access levels. So this allows us to uh, set it up so that uh, we can go in there and we can make programming changes and do troubleshooting and that kind of things, but we can set it up so that the operators can't and so that the guys in the office can't. So user manager is what takes care of who gets in and who gets to look around and what do they get to see. Uh, other functions include network tools, uh, things like links uh, would fall into this category here, you know, things that allow us to uh, communicate between the different elements of the, of the system. Oops, Explorer uh, configures the controller and their I.O. So just like we had in, in uh, Logix, we get the Explorer window with the, with the tree on the side and it shows all of our program and our I.O. and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's all in there. Database administrator. Uh, software that allows to, us to create, delete, copy, clean, and backup of our databases. And it runs in the background. You don't often see this. Uh, software that uh, you may have heard of includes things like uh, Historian, for example. Uh, and it runs in the background. Every time something changes in the process, it records it, saves it, stores it, and if someone needs it, it's there. And then at the end of the day, usually it'll do a, a complete backup of everything and then store that in a, in a historian server somewhere. So if down the road you want to compare this month to last month, all that data is still there and that's handled by the database administration software. Other things you might find, uh, asset management, things like um, AMS. So if you're a, a Spartan, Rosemount, Guy, Fisher Guy, uh, AMS is one of their things, and this is software that's built into uh, your operator, um, I guess you're not your operator station, but your engineering workstation so that you can go in there and you can do troubleshooting. And uh, I'll, we don't do much with that in, in the class, but I can show you uh, some of the features of uh, asset management, uh, change management, and tuning software. So these are all usually part and parcel uh, with the suite and uh, you will experience most of this. You'll get your auto-tune and things like that are in there. So all different software that is uh, wrapped up into this uh, software suite that you usually get depending on your system. Okay, so probably these next few slides I don't need to talk much about anymore because I 
probably just did that all on the, on the main slide, but uh, user manager again uh, sets privilege levels. So administrator usually has total system access minus programming, uh, depending on where you where you are. This is up to uh, this is up to the person that sets it up to say who's who's going to be what and what access are they going to have. Um, but in, in terms of the ILM. We just have to know that there are different levels. Uh, there are reasons, of course, why we would want some people to have access to some things and not have access to other things. So this isn't always written in stone, but according to the ILM, uh, this is this is what we're looking at. So the administrator, typically you'll have total system access. Uh, if I was the instrument guy there, um, I would probably have you know full access to everything. Uh, engineering level uh, usually get, pr prohibits uh, access to uh, the accounting things and stuff like that, but it does want us to be able to configure uh, control strategies and HMI, so programming, things like that would be in there. Technician level uh, generally allows access for maintenance and diagnostics, and that's, of course, the big benefit of these digital systems is that we can connect anywhere, and especially true if we have an asset management system, um, we can do it right from a computer. We can go out there and we can see uh, how's this transmitter doing, how's that transmitter doing, are there any sensor issues, temperature issues, whatever it happens to be. We can tell how many times a valve is opened and closed and when and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, operator uh, level and operator access here, basically all we want those guys to do is to be able to operate that HMI to run the plant. You know put it in auto, put it in manual, raise the set point, lower the set point, turn it off, turn it on, that kind of thing. So user manager sets all the privileges for who gets to do what. Here's the Explorer window, so part of that software here. This is where we configure the controller and all our I.O. This is no different uh, in, in Delta V than it is uh, in uh, Studio 5000. So same idea, Explorer-based, expand, expand, expand. Here's what's going on. Nothing dramatically new there. Okay, control strategy software. Uh, we've played with this already here. Uh, all uh, written under uh, the umbrella, the uh, IEC 61131 or the IEEE 61131, uh, including the different programming languages that we've uh, discussed earlier, ladder diagram, function block, SFC, structured text, text and instruction list. Um, we're familiar with most of these. We talk about all of these four in the ILM. We don't talk about instruction list at all, but it's great little kernel hiding in the PowerPoint that I can always throw at you. What's the fifth language? Um, but that's, that's it. So these are the five major languages. Uh, IEC 61804-2 uh, function block, which is becoming the most common. Uh, for me, I don't know if it is for sure, but according to the ILM here, it's yellow. So this is a self-test question and says that this is most common. So I will buy into that because I'm old and I'm not on the cutting edge anymore. So I will believe these guys. <clears throat> so different software that is involved here. So this is what function block looks like in very general uh, terms. Once we get into the lab, you guys will get some experience with Delta V in their version of the function blocks. <coughs> HMI programming software. So we've only looked at uh, software that's used to create the logic behind the operation of, of the systems up till now. Um, but in order for us to be able to use it, we obviously have to have some kind of an interface between the machine and the man. And that's where HMI software comes in. It's used by the operators to respond to alarms, operate equipment, and change the set points and things like that. A lot of science goes into HMI displays in terms of what they look like, how busy they are, how easy they are to read, how much information is displayed. There's a whole, uh, there's a whole science behind this. Um, and this organization called the Abnormal Situation Management Consortium publishes guidelines uh, for effective operator display and design. And just like you know, there's there's big-headed people out there, smart people out there that'll that'll tell me that my powerpoints have too much information on them. There's people out there that'll say, yeah, this 
diagram here, way too much information, way too confusing, too many buttons to press, uh, way too many opportunities for an operator to misunderstand or make an error. So there's a lot of science that goes into the design uh, of HMIs and we barely just touch on it in, in fourth year. But if you get into this uh, branch of instrumentation, you'll be, you'll be going to lots of courses that'll teach you all about that. Objective three, how does the data move? So we're gonna describe data flow, scan cycle, and databases of a DCI. Okay, database, uh, as hopefully we're aware, uh, organized collection of digital data. Okay, the database system allows you to store, modify, and extract information when you need it in from the database uh, that's stored in the server somewhere. In general, the DCS has three different databases. We have an operational database that contains the configuration, all the programming, and the value of all the parameters and tags at this moment. The historical database uh, resides uh, also in the server and kind of operates in the background, and it is continuously updating uh, with the current process information uh, and allows us to reuse that data to create trends and see what's going on uh, or what has occurred over time or throughout history. The third database that we look at is the alarm database. Uh, and the alarm database will record, display, and organize uh, the alarms and events as they occur. And this is a, an important tool uh, for us in terms of troubleshooting and probably more so for operations. But if, for example, we have a, a plant trip and we're not sure why we've had a plant trip, we can go back into the alarm database and we can say, okay, what was the first alarm in uh, at one o'clock? The plant tripped at 105, so let's go to one o'clock and see what the first thing was that tripped. And we can say, oh, well, this PT here uh, tripped on low pressure and then that caused this to shut down and caused this to shut down. We got to learn for that. So it allows us to, uh, you know, look back and, and see what happened. So it's a good, tool for uh, discovering what has happened. So data flow for a database, basically we've, we've touched on this uh, several times already here, but we have the server that stores that data that's shared by operations and the controller network. So the field devices are continuously measuring, sending that information to the controller through the IO. The controller does some uh, comparison to what it's seeing from the operator workstation, compares the set point to the PV, does some math, and then sends out a signal to the final control element. At the same time, all that data, whenever data comes in or data comes out, it gets sent here, and these database tables get updated. And that's how the data gets moved back and forth. So it's in and out, and this is basically, this is our warehouse. Here's where things get a little bit tricky. Uh, I'm not sure necessarily the purpose of these diagrams out of the ILM. I, I personally find them uh, a little bit confusing uh, the way they go through them, so I don't spend a whole bunch of time with words on them because I'm more likely to confuse you than not. Um, but as you uh, look through these different diagrams, and you'll see here the next few slides, I got three or four of them, and they're all a little bit different. Um, pay attention to the unique differences uh, between uh, the two of them here. So it, it usually is based around the server and, and how the data, um, the data gets shared. Okay, so I have a note here on the bottom of this screen that says the loss of the server means the loss of the data attached to it. It will still operate from the HMI to the controller. So if we lose the server, yeah. I, again, this will be something that the more I talk, the more confused you guys will get. Um, but um, we're going to look at different types of networks here. So four of them. The first one is peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay, the second one they call upload-download peer-to-peer. So not too much has changed here. Uh, we have the controller sends data to the HMI memory, receives data, from the HMI memory sends data to the historical database through the server. So this data, the server is important. Um, 
yeah, what's it doing? It's basically sending information from the HMI to the controller. So peer to peer, here to there. Next one here is an upload download peer to peer. So what do we got going on here? Again, uh, here we go from the controller to the database and out to the users, kind of just like the lab is laid out. Client server network here, you'll notice the difference between the first two is that we've now got a direct connection. Oops, between the server here, the server's on the bus here. It's on the bus here, but now we have a direct connection between the HMIs here, so client server as well this. Uh, the server is a central location where the users share access and network resources. Um, you'll see that here we have redundant servers and those are in place for reliability. Uh, if any of these servers were to fail, the field devices would still work. Everything outside would still work, but the HMIs and all that stuff would not work. So this is why we have redundancy. If one of these were to fail, the other one would take over. If they both failed, uh, we'd still be running, but we wouldn't be able to tell what's going on. Last one, upload, download using client server. So I would imagine this is probably um, what you will see in most typical applications, just like everything else. We kind of start out simple, uh, something that's got problems, then something that's developed to get rid of the problems of the earlier version, and then so on and so forth until we get to where we are here with the upload, download uh, using the, the client server here. So all kinds of wonderful errors, uh, arrows going on here. Um, I'll have to double check to see what kind of torture I want to put you guys through in terms of testing uh, for these ones, but I, I don't think you have too much to uh, worry about here. Uh, I would have to double, I'd have to double check to see uh, the severity of these, but just uh, for now, know that there are, are four different kind of network configuration styles. Okay, building on that, how do we get the data? When is the data uh, gathered? Uh, that's done through a scan cycle, and we've touched on scan cycles before. Uh, you know, how long does it take for uh, the polling to occur, or the, uh, what was that? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Master slave, and the polling, and the, you know, hot potato. How long does it take for a scan cycle? So. Where does the data come from? So it gets collected every scan cycle. So a scan cycle is a single sweep of a control system's operation. So every single, excuse me, IO point from start to finish gets scanned continuously over and over again. And the scan time is the amount of time that it takes for one scan cycle to complete. And this is a very short period of time, milliseconds, whatever it is. The time it takes for a digital device to operate is called the update time, and we'll spend a little bit more uh, time detailing what that means. Okay, so update time, scan cycle, and macro cycle. These are, oh, and execution time. So every component in the system requires some time to do processing. And we're talking about milliseconds for, for all of these things, basically. But they're not all the same. Uh, we've learned, for example, that it might take me uh, a minute to go around the classroom, for example, and to say, uh, how, how is everybody? How are, how are you feeling, uh, Dylan Kosh? How are you feeling, Dylan W? How are you feeling, Jared? How are you feeling, Corey? That, that might take me two minutes. Uh, it takes you a second to say good or bad. So my, my scan time is two minutes. Your, uh, your execution time is a second. So that relationship exists in, in a system. So execution time uh, is configured specifically to each loop. And they're saying that should be half of the macro cycle time. So if it takes five seconds to go through scanning all the IO, we want the execution time to be half of that so that we make sure that we get fresh data every single cycle. The IO uh, scan follows uh, the execution time. So we don't want to be uh, reading more than we need to or missing a reading. So we want to make sure that those two times uh, match up together fairly well. Uh, macro cycle uh, programmed during field bus, field bus commissioning and the macro cycle uh, is something that we consider when we're, when we're setting our execution time. And I'm not going to go into the 
details of the macro cycle because it's kind of way up there in terms of what we need to know. Um, but for us, we're concerned with uh, update times, the I.O. scan cycles, and the execution times of the controller and field bus network. So the way the controller scan cycle works kind of works like this, and you'll have some uh, questions uh, relating to the scan cycle and when and where does it happen and how does it happen and what things does it look for. Uh, redundancy management, for example, has the highest priority uh, for maintenance tasks, whereas control strategies will have uh, the ones with the lowest execution time will have the highest priority and the ones with the most execution time will have the lowest priority. So it's all about uh, utilizing resources and trying to keep our uh, computation power uh, economized, you know, not to spend as not to spend as much energy processing as, as we can, but getting the best efficiency out of our out of our CPU. So you'll see here uh, as we go as we go through them here uh, through the scan cycle, we have the, the control section, we have the maintenance section, and different priorities that it goes through as we scan. And I will expect you to do, to uh, understand this at least to the depth of uh, the ILM self test questions. Okay, so here's a scan cycle and a hot tip. Uh, you will see a diagram very similar to this. I guarantee it. So I'll let that out. Uh, what is the total scan cycle for this controller? Uh, what is the execution time for FIC1? These are giveaways. These are gimmies for you guys. Uh, you must know this. You must know how to figure out how to do this. Uh, it's not difficult. And uh, it's pretty straightforward here. So if we want to say, what is the total scan cycle for the controller? Someone want to tell me without without cheating? One second. One second. Start starts here. Scans everything. Scans, 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 and ends here, and then starts again. Goes through like this. So the total scan cycle is a thousand millisecond. What's the execution time for FIC1? Well, it happens here, it happens here, it happens here, it happens here, and it happens here. So 50 to 250, that's 200. 250 to 450, that's 200. 450 to 650, that's 200. So the execution time for FIC1 is every 200 milliseconds. Right? I'm going to refresh and send my data to the controller every 200 milliseconds. That way I know for sure that every time it scans, it's getting at least refreshed once every time it scans. Right? Then we have the priorities uh, highlighted on the, on, the different, uh, on the previous slide there where it'll, it'll say, okay, well, I better look at redundancy management, make sure everything's working. Scan, make sure the communi communication's working all that kind of stuff, then we'll scan for diagnostics at the end because it's not as high as a priority, and then we'll go through it all over again. Uh, note box here says, DCS controller should be loaded in a way that maintains a minimum of 10 to 20% of free time, which means that you don't want to have so many things in there that, it, that it's too busy, right? We want to keep it so that it can do the thinking that it needs to do, given all the inputs and outputs that it has to deal with. So that's kind of the general big picture uh, thing of how the DCS works. It's all about the hardware, the, the layout of the network, um, the software that we use, and the way that the scan cycle uh, gathers and collects data. So summary, hardware components of the DCS are functionally integrated, but also separated by subsystems. The system buses are grouped into four levels, enterprise, operations engineering, controller, and field bus or process level. DCS has operation system software, control strategy software, and HMI software. DCS also contains an operational, historical, and alarm database, and the data flow is dependent on the types of networks which we looked at, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, uh, one style of that, and then client-server, there was three of them. And then the scan cycle of the DCS uses priorities and the scan time, which varies depending on the amount of tasks that are assigned. So that's DCS. Uh, 101 and I hope that was not too bad for you guys it shouldn't have been too bad anyone have any questions is there going to be a new calendar for 
following week after this? That's a long weekend. Uh, no, I'm going to leave it up till the 25th because I'm going to hope that we're going back to school. Um, but basically, if you're if you're in a spot where you're not sure what's next, just do what's next. Just stay stay in order and continue on with the next ILM if you're looking for something to do. But we'll have a better idea by next week, right? So follow the 50-day schedule. Yeah, I just or just keep going on the ILMs. Like if you're if you're looking uh, for something to do, if they don't let us back, and I'll tell you guys what happens if they don't let us back into the college. What what I'm going to recommend most of you guys do is pick a subject and hammer that subject out, write the final, move on to the next subject, hammer that subject out, write the final, and and so on, rather than jumping back and forth. Uh, jumping back and forth is fine as long as we're all following along and we're kind of doing the lectures. Um, but when you're on your own, you, you will probably you'll probably find it more easy to keep the data fresh in your head to just say, I'm going to do communications this week and I'm going to do them all. And I'm going to write the final and then it's going to be behind me. Because once you write the final exam for the subject, that's it. There's no there's no there's no other test, right? So you can forget it and then you can move on to the next one. But we'll see what happens. It all depends whether they bring us back into class or not. I just asked him what's on the analyzer's test, but I don't know why he hasn't been responding.